of nations. The high standard of living that we enjoy today is a direct byproduct of the steam engine, the laser, the transistor, the computer. So science is the driving force that makes possible the elevation of, the, of society. Realize that just a few hundred years ago, we had a tiny percentage of human population being kings and queens and nobles, and about 99% of the human population living in an abject poverty, grinding, back-breaking poverty. That changed with the coming of the steam engine and the industrial revolution, and that helped to create a middle class. So the middle class that we are witnessing, for example, growing in China right before our eyes is a direct consequence of the technology, the inventions, and the Chinese are very clear about this. Why are they sending all their PhD students to America where I see them? In fact, one of my graduate students was in fact Chinese. Half our physics department is foreign. A hundred percent of our physics department is actually foreign born in terms of the PhD program. So the Chinese understand this. They, they make no bones about it that they want to get as much of science and technology because the West, you know, lives off its laurels. They know, the Chinese know, that this is going to be the source of their wealth. It's a meal ticket, a meal ticket to the future. Now, you also mentioned the fact that we are very backward socially. And part of that fact is that our brain, our personalities haven't changed for 100,000 years. 100,000 years ago, the best evidence shows that modern humans, Humans that look just like us, you give them a haircut, a three-piece suit, put them on Wall Street, they look like all the other barbarians on Wall Street. People just like us emerged from Africa 100,000 years ago. That's why societies are so painfully backward, while inventions can travel at the speed of light. And that's the reason why, on one hand, we reach for the stars, but on the other hand, we have feet of clay, which is very sad. But again, it's the march of science that eventually creates the industries that will enrich. So you can't separate the two. However, on television, almost the entire debate on television is who gets to rob Peter to pay Paul? How are we going to redistribute the pie? How are we going to cut the pie slight, slitter and thinner and thinner? My attitude is get a bigger pie. And where does that bigger pie come from? Well, yeah, tax credits, yeah, entrepreneurial ship, yeah, yeah, all that. But it mainly comes from invention, science. That's where the pie gets bigger. Michio Kaku, where were you born? You were born in 1947. Where were you born and raised? Who were your parents? Uh, well, first of all, my grandparents came from Japan about 100 years ago. In fact, my grandfather was in the 1906 San Francisco earthquake and helped with the uh, cleanup operation. Uh, my parents actually grew up in Japan. They were born in America, grew up in Japan, which is common for immigrants. Uh, and then they came back to America right before World War II, which was the wrong time to come back to America. <laughs> they were placed in a relocation camp from 1942 to 1946. They met at camp, got married at camp, and I was born soon after uh, the camp opened up. But for four years, they lived behind machine guns and barbed wire. So you were born in camp, in an internment camp? I was born camp. right after camp. My older brother was actually born in camp. And then myself and my younger brother were born after the camps opened up in 1946. And I knew even as a kid that if science was going to change society, how can a poor little kid with, with uh, poverty-stricken parents ever have a chance of making it in society? So when I was in high school, I realized that I had to like seize my own destiny. So I went to my mother one day and I said, Mom, can I have permission to build an atom smasher in the garage? A 2.3 million electron volt betatron electron particle accelerator. And she said, sure, why not? And don't forget to take out the garbage. Well, I took out the garbage. I went to Westinghouse, Varian Associates. I got 400 pounds of transformer steel, 22 miles of copper wire, and I created a 2.3 million electron volt betatron in my garage. It consumed so much power that I blew out every single circuit breaker in the house. My poor mom, she'd come back late from work, the lights would be flickering and die, and she'd say, where's the fuse box? And then she must have said to herself, why can't my son play basketball? Why can't he play football? Why can't 
he find a nice Japanese girlfriend? I mean, why does he have to build these machines in the garage? Well, that machine helped to get me into Harvard. So I can't begrudge the benefits of building atom smashers for his science fair project. But because I built that machine, um, I earned the attention of an atomic physicist who immediately knew what I was doing. I was, was working that? with antimatter. He saw my experiment and <laughs> he knew exactly what I was doing. No explanation or whatever. That scientist was Edward Teller, the father of the hydrogen bomb, took an interest in me. He funded my four years at Harvard University. So that set me off. However, after I graduated from Harvard, he wanted to know, in fact, he really pushed for me to go into weapons work, to design hydrogen warheads, hydrogen bombs. Physicists do work on these things. I, even today, some of my colleagues work on hydrogen warheads. However, I did not want to go that way. I wanted to work on an even bigger explosion than a hydrogen bomb. I wanted to work on the creation of the universe. I wanted to know why the laws of motion and the laws of the universe are the way they are at the instant of the Big Bang. So I went on a different route. Dr. Kaku, have you been given government grants? Yes, the, my PhD was paid for by the Air Force and the National Science Foundation uh, does pay for our physics department's research. So uh, the answer is yes, uh, the government does support science, which I think is a good thing. However, I think the support is minimal compared to a few battleships and uh, a few of the latest inventions of the Pentagon. But um, yeah, we do depend upon government support. What kind of work did your parents do? Uh, my father was a gardener. After World War II, it was very hard to get a job. There was a lot of anti-Japanese sentiment. But in the Bay Area, where my parents settled, uh, there was a need for gardeners. And my mother was a maid. And they would dream, dream about sending their kids to college. Next call for Michio Kaku comes from Boston. Bruce, hi. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, I've very recently just gotten into uh, astronomy, and I enjoy your, uh, you on the Science Channel very much. I uh, have one question about Mercury and one question about Jupiter. Sure. Uh, I, I don't think it was on your program, but I uh, saw on TV that Mercury has a double sunrise, and I thought that's fascinating if you could talk about that. And they only recently dis dis agreed on a formal definition for what a dead planet is. Do you think Mercury is a dead planet because there's no life and because, or because there's no activity at its core? And do you think that, uh, is it true that Jupiter was almost a star like our sun, but there wasn't quite enough heat and pressure at the core to kickstart the nuclear fusion process? All right, Bruce, we got three questions there. Okay, Jupiter right. and Mercury. <laughs> okay, let's take it one at a time. Um, first of all, if you take a look at uh, Mercury, Mercury we think is a dead planet because it's simply too close to the sun, it's boiling hot, water would simply turn to steam and eventually maybe even break apart. You have to be what is called in the Goldilocks zone from the sun, not too close where water turns to steam, not too far where liquid water turns to ice, but just right from the sun so that you have liquid water. Liquid water is the universal solvent. It's where DNA got off the ground. So we think that planets in the Goldilocks zone can be, in fact, um, the, the potential uh, creator of, of life forms. Just last week, it was announced by astronomers that they have finally found such a planet, a twin of the Earth. It's maybe three, four, three or four times more massive than the Earth, but it is smack in the middle of the Goldilocks zone. And that changes everything, because it means it may have liquid oceans. It means it may have DNA. We don't know for sure. But this is a game changer, and it only happened just last week. Mercury, on the other hand, is too close to the sun, and as a consequence, we think it's unsuitable for life. Farther out, we have the gas giants like Jupiter, where we don't think uh, we have uh, enough liquid water, except maybe on Europa, a moon of Jupiter. That has an ocean, we think, under the ice cover. So there are two places in the universe where we could have liquid oceans. One, in the Goldilocks zone, like the Earth, and second of all, under the ice cover of Europa. Last question was about Jupiter. Is it possible that Jupiter can ignite into becoming a star? If you saw the movie 2010, a sequel to the movie 2001, at the end of the movie, the aliens ignite Jupiter, and we become a double star system. Well, it's not going to happen. Jupiter is about 10 times or so too small.
However, if Jupiter were more massive, perhaps around 10 times larger, then the answer is yes, we would have been in a double star system. And again, most of the star systems we see in space are double star systems. Our solar system is rather strange. We have a single star with planets going around it, while most stars are part of a double star and even a triple star system. Michio Kaku, let's go back to the uh, parallel Earth that was recently discovered. How was it discovered? Is this a huge deal? Uh, how far away is it, et cetera, et cetera? Well, detectives say, follow the money. Astronomers say, follow the water. Because where there is liquid water, there could be life. And that's the game changer that took place just last week. This is the holy grail of planet finders. That is, finding an Earth-like planet in the Goldilocks zone. This planet is 20 light years away from the Earth. It's about 120 trillion miles away from us. So a Saturn rocket would take tens of thousands of years to reach that planet. So don't think we're going to find anything soon or, or visit that planet anytime soon. However, it's part of a six-planet system, a red dwarf with six planets going around it. One of these planets is the Gliese 581g, the planet that was just identified. Size-wise, it's about 20% uh, larger than the Earth, size-wise, but mass-wise, it's about three to four times larger than the Earth. But the important thing is that it's smack in the middle of the Goldilocks zone. We hit the jackpot on this one. And remember that we're now going to find hundreds of these Earth-like twins. We have the Kepler and the Corot satellites in orbit, two satellites, one American, one French. They are specifically designed to find hundreds of Earth-like twins in outer space. So one night, when you look at the night sky, you will say, there, there, there are Earth-like twins. And you will wonder whether anyone is looking back at us. Doctor, do you think at some point we'll, re we'll think, I don't know why we chased water? What's the importance of water? Well, water, well, first of all, water dissolves most materials. It's the universal solvent. It does not dissolve certain oils or certain minerals, but many chemicals are dissolvable in water, including hydrocarbons like amino acids and proteins, and most important, DNA. DNA is important because it can make a copy of itself. Starting with one DNA molecule, you get two, then four, then 8, 16, 32, 164, 256, and then you have life taking over an entire planet. That's why we say follow the water. And on Jupiter, a moon of Jupiter, underneath the ice core, we have Europa with a liquid ocean underneath, whose volume may actually be bigger than the volume of our oceans, because our oceans are very thin. The oceans of Europa could be very deep. NASA wants to send a submarine. NASA has plans to send a submarine drilling right through the ice cover and then swimming underwater. And we think that Europa's could be much more common than Earth's in outer space. Now, you ask how we detect them. If a planet goes around the mother star, they actually orbit around a center of gravity like a spinning dumbbell. Now, you remove the planet because you can't see the planet, and the sun uh, wobbles. So it's the wobbling of the mother star that we look for because the whole system cannot be observed by telescope. That's how we found this planet in space. This is Book TV's In Depth, and our guest this month is Dr. Michio Kaku, who is a theoretical physicist, teaches at City College of New York, has been teaching there for the last 25 years, hosts a program on the Science Channel, hosts a couple of radio science programs, and is taking your calls. Winter Park. Colorado, go ahead with your question. Hello, how you doing, sir? Very good. It's a real you know, privilege to you know, uh, you know, speak with you. I was dying to have a chance to ask this you know question. I follow you on the radio. I have a two-part question, and it's a very raw and simple uh, in part. Um, the first part of the question is: Is it possible? In the, in the view of the scientist, to build a vehicle that will, that will travel faster than the speed of planet Earth and it will you know, orbit Earth, um, the opposite, you know, the opposite to, its, to, its own, 
total movement in order to bring an object 